Alright, so we're going to do modern philosophy, and the subtitle is Classical Philosophers and Philosophies Part 1. Now, what this means by classical philosophers doesn't mean that we're going to cover the classical, which are the Greek and Roman philosophers, but classical is in their prominent in the modern time period. The modern philosophy time periods are from the 18th century to the 20th century, about 300 plus years. It covers a lot of people you probably know right now, Law, Hobbes, Spinoza, Descartes, those kind of people. So what we're going to do is that we're going to explore the prominent members of those modern philosophies and going to talk about their philosophies. All right, so Thomas Hobbes is probably one of the best philosophers you talked about. You know, the, you probably know him as the guy who wrote the Leviathan, maybe the guy who authorized the authoritarian state, the big three players in political philosophy in the classical era. So he did write the Leviathan, and he did propose an authoritarian government, but his reasoning is quite interesting. He argued that without civilization, everything would be in ruins. He proposed a state in which it was a free-for-all from all of humanity. Basically, people had what did whatever they wanted in the state of nature. Now, contrast that with the nature right now you might think that in a state of nature it's all good like what Rousseau argued but what really is that humans have too big of a desire that runs contrary to what the state of nature is people have greed that enables them to take how many they want non never mind how many they need so what's going on by Thomas Hobbes said is that what's going to happen is that people are going to have a state of crisis in which they kill each other they steal each other without any regard to any other people except themselves and maybe their family now a thing to note here is that Thomas Hobbes lived during the English oops let me get that back on English Civil War the English Civil War was the time when they tried a revolution against the English government. It failed at the end, but what happened is that brothers killed each other. There were people that neighbors killing each other. There were guns. There were fights everywhere. Thomas, Thomas Hobbes saw a lot of death, so he theorized that this is what an anarchy must have been like. And he argued that in an anarchy, a government had to come for a civilization to exist. And he asked, how can such a government form when people are only subject to themselves and not others? And he said that then it must be a social contract. He was the idea, he was the first person that formed the idea of the social contract. He argued that every man must submit to one person, but who can that person be? And he said that it wasn't necessarily a person, but it was an idea. An idea of the greatest possible being, not God, Thomas Hobbes. It wouldn't really like God. He was an atheist. He did relate the idea to God later in his book, The Leviathan, but this was just to apply to Christians. His main idea was that this person, the greatest person, the most powerful person he can imagine, is called the sovereign. Now, the sovereign is the person that rules over everything. The first generation sovereign, when they first make the society, has to be the greatest person in their midst. The smartest person, the most physically perfect person fit to rule the society. And this was the social contract. Now, of course, the problem is how can this society be continued? After the first generation dies out, the second generation won't submit to the ruler, the third generation won't submit to their ruler, and the first monarch eventually has to die so they can't continue the tradition. And so he argued that the best state has to be a constant, an absolute monarchy. Now, it has to be absolute because it reflects the power of the government, which is the sovereign. Other forms like oligarchy or democracy don't properly reflect the power of the sovereign. The sovereign, Thomas Hobbes argued, has to be the greatest power. And if it's a democracy bound by constitutions, laws, and people's opinions, that's not the absolute opinion. What Thomas Hobbes said was that the absolute power, the ruling power, must accurately reflect the power of the sovereign as much as possible so it has to be an absolute power it has to be a monarchy because if it's not a monarchy there will be a fight to see who would get the drone after this first generation died of course now the monarch would by definition, be the smartest, the strongest, the physically and psychologically most fit person. So what he's going to do is that he's going to do everything best for the society. If you're already reflecting on the values of an absolute country, absolute sovereign, then you need then what's going to be the best form is that you're going to have the at best things do done for the country since he's running the country it's not going to be good for him it's, if his country is full of ruin econ by economical or health related or war related reasons so what he said was that this monarch would be the smartest person in the community and he would do only the best things for that society and the continuum of the society could be then resolved because the monarch would solve it by choosing the best possible successor and by definition since he's going to have the best government that would be the best successor and so forth for all of eternity his metaphysical views are apt to be mentioned in mentioning Thomas Hobbes. He was a materialist in the fact that not he only did cared about social possessions, that would be the contemporary materialist. He was a classical materialist who argued that everything was just made out of material. 
So ourselves is only defined by us. And if we take that away from us, there's no mind or body. There's just the brain. There's only electricity. We're like machines being pulled like puppets on a string by our nerves and electricity. Now, Spinoza is an interesting case. His full name is Brooks Spinoza. He's a very moral person, but he also happened to believe in destiny. So it was interesting how we reconciled that. So his three major points is political philosophy, ethics, and metaphysics. Ethics and metaphysics are similar because he tried to reconcile both. His political philosophy was a little similar to Hobbes. He had a lot similar, actually. He argued for an absolute government. He didn't really like monarchies much. He also argued that the church has to be regulated by the government, which was an addition to Hobbes' philosophy, but that's not really a major difference. He only probably based that off his own philosophy, which had to do with religion. So... His ethics were a lot interesting. He argued that people had to do generally what was good, which is generally the view of ethics. But he also said in his metaphysics that everything comprised of God. We only see the world as part of God. We don't see the exact thing, which is why we are humans, that why we are prone to errors. Now, the problem is if everything is made out of God, that means ethics is pointless. Because everything's made out of God, everything must be predestined. If you're a part of God, that means we're fit to do a certain role. But he argued that it's not about the ethics itself that makes us do it. It's not the freedom of choice. He argued that freedom of choice was not doing the things that you wanted, but the freedom of choice was knowing why you're taking this path. There's a problem in ethical philosophy with destiny. Is that if you if there's fate, if there's two doors and one's locked, then you're forced to choose the other door. How can this possibly be your freedom of choice? If the other one is locked, then you can't go through it. Spinoza argued, no, that's not the freedom. The difference between animals and humans is that both people are forced to do certain actions by their conditioning. But only humans know when why we take that door. Animals can continue ramming themselves against the locked door, but humans know why we take the open door because it's open and it'll lead to the same path as we know it. So we argued that what we need to do about ethics is not about the freedom of choice, it's not about our actions, but how we take it. His passions is very similar to the Stoics that we mentioned earlier in the Hellenistic era. He argued that a lot of passion is bad for anything. He said that this goes to his ethics of fate. He said that what we need to do for goodness is that we don't need to do how we regulate our actions. That's already fate. We should try to do good, of course, if we think we have a choice. But what we really need to do is we need to regulate our emotions that we can't be good. The problem with the Stoics was that he they took everything way too seriously. They said that if, even if his mother died, the Stoics didn't like grieving because they said that it couldn't personally affect them except emotionally and emotionally was a bad thing. But Spinoza was a little softer in that he reconciled it by saying that emotions are good only in the fact that they live and leave an impression. They can't continue to govern our lives forever. So what we need to do is that we need to take those emotions and we need to control them. Kind of like the Stoics, but not as extreme. Then he argued that the ethics of fate, ethics of fate then is perceiving the goodness. Not the passions which cloud our judgment and emotions which makes us do things unsensibly, but the ethics of fate had to do with us knowing that it's good and following that it is. It is a very complicated doctrine, and his books are written in a way that is slightly boring. He uses geometrical proof that you have to prove exactly what he says, but that's his philosophy, and it is somewhat coherent. The last person that opposed Spinoza would be, not the last person that opposed Spinoza, but the last person in this presentation who has opposed Spinoza, be Leibniz. You probably know him as the inventor of calculus along with Newton, but he also did a lot of philosophy as well. So Leibniz also argued that God was the only being. But instead of saying that we are all part of God, Leibniz said that we were made of little modes. Now modes, it's difficult to picture what modes are. Leibniz defined it as a one person or one being or anything that actually contains it. Imagine a space when there's millions of stars that never interact, can't ever be with each other or do anything in a physical or mental way. That would be what modes are like. Modes, those little stars represent one of us. And what we are is that we're trapped in the container and our possession of the society would be what it is like in the star. We don't know what it's like. And Leibniz argued then that the only way universe could actually function would be the God taking all the modes and functioning them together because modes can't interfere with each other. If two little spears bump into each other, nothing's going to happen inside. So we argued that God has to moderate everything. He gave four proofs of God, <clears throat> which is important in the post 
uh, medieval doctrine, the ontological proof, the cosmological proof, the eternal truth, and the pre-established harmony. The ontological proof has to do with the definition of perfection. Other people also mentioned it, but Leibniz, I think Leibniz perfects it in this point. He says that the ontological argument is that God is a perfect being, and by definition, he has to exist, because by definition, existing is more perfect than not existing. That is a debatable point because later thinkers have argued on the point of perfect. We'll cover that later in Immanuel Kant, but he argued that that's why God must exist. In the cosmological proof, he argued that everything's cause must have everything to for it to exist must have a cause outside of itself. For example, if there's the universe, then it must have a cause pertaining outside of itself that must cause the universe. It's simply a better way of phrasing Thomas Aquinas' proof of God that we covered, but it does it is harder to refute. He argued then that that hand must be God. He also pointed out that that, has, that only means there's a creator, not necessarily the most perfect being. But he did that it is a coherent proof in that there has to be a being outside of the universe who caused the universe, and Leibniz argued it was God. He argued, also argued for eternal truth. This is the fact that Everything, some things are eternal, and he argued that, but the universe is not eternal, it's finite, therefore there has to be some eternity somewhere in the universe outside the universe, and that contradiction could be only solved by God. And he also argued the pre-established harmony, Kant dubbed it the psychotheological argument, and Leibniz did say that the only way to accept this proof was only by believing in his philosophy. If you accept that moans are actually the part of the universe, then you also have to accept that God could only be the being that could cause the interaction between the moans and for us to exist.